Hello, people. How are you doing? Today, I want to talk about the book Poor Economics that is written by Apijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, two of the professors in MIT who received a Nobel Prize in Economics in 2019. This topic has been something that I'm interested about and is an uncomfortable topic worth mentioning, studying, and deep diving into. So, by doing this video, I hope that you are able to answer in these four episodes that I'm going to be doing to the questions. Why poverty exists? How can we fight poverty? What economics has done in the past, and why they failed to stop poverty? And an explanation of the randomized control experiment performed by many and the others. So, without further ado, let's do it. On this first episode, I am going to be talking about the topic of why poverty exists. And FYI. All the information that I'm going to be sharing here come from the research of the book that I did it myself. So, why poverty exists? Poverty can be as old as mankind. Poverty can simply be due to geography, such as landlocked areas that provide no access to nutritious seafood, or climate in relation to a country's latitude and longitude that cause hot and infertile land. This is a factor that can impose difficulties to a country's productivity and therefore lower investments. Poverty at the core is an inability to buy. The things that are helpful become unaffordable to them. Living on 99 cents a day means you have limited access to information, be it newspaper, television, or books. This can cause people to not realize the value of feeding themselves and their children well enough, as the importance of micronutrition might not be well understood, which is somewhat associated with higher income. When education costs money or a lot of money, for those who can't afford, the quality of education no longer matters because they know that the actual benefits or the returns from education take time and is long waited. This results in having these parents decided not to send their children to school or only sending the intelligent ones. They're in inadvertently create an education-based poverty trap. These kids go to work at an early age and have no prerequisite education to acquire future high-earning income positions, which creates a waste of talent. Poverty makes children deem as financial instrument, as the book says. For many parents, children are their economic futures. An insurance policy, a saving product, and some lottery tickets all rolled in a convenient pin-sized package. This idea can be intensified by a lack of social security, mutual funds, retirement plans, and health insurance, either public or private. Thus, having many children becomes a norm. The others also argue that low usage of contraception is not necessarily a sign of lack of access, but by being uneducated, these women have little knowledge about contraception. They do not recognize the legitimacy of their sexual desires, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America. A culture can dictate a place, as decisions for fertility are made by older male spouses that are usually happened with young, uneducated, and less economically viable women. These are the factors that often result in having large families because it is hard for them to stand up against their husband. Agricultural wages can be volatile. The risk is not limited to income or food, but that of health, political violence, crime, and corruption. This can be called risk-based poverty trap. As an immediate cutback, whether when doing a business, being hit by a financial crisis, or a bad break resulting in bad houses that all make their trajectory trend going downward, a situation likely to create the S-shaped situation, which I will elaborate later. This can easily attach a psychological breakdown and stress from the loss of hope and increasing fear. They can be prone to depression, as the author suggests. Symptoms of depression are much more prevalent among the poor. Being stressed make it harder to focus, which in turn may make us less productive. In particular, there is a strong association between poverty and the level of cortisol produced by the body. 
an indicator of stress and conversely, the cortisol levels go down when household receives some help. The others also argue that when their mental space become heavily stressed, indulgence at the presence is spent on alcohol, tobacco, festivals, and snacks instead of looking ahead for the future. When she pleasant dominates, saving for emergencies become less of a priority. Lack of social security and health insurance can be a poverty trap. When one is sick, this impacts the other member of family to try find money for medical care, which might have resulted in borrowing money lenders and end up in debt. Little capital can cause a trust issue. Banks are unwilling to give a deal, which often results in them borrowing high interest rate, profiteering money lenders. This reliance of informal sources is a result of low credibility associating with a high administrating cost of running an account, such as a withdrawal fee or a background check, which lowers their access to cheaper formal source. And that it is a default that traps them and has them losing their collateral. This means that poor borrowers will be able to borrow less from the formal banking system because the checking process of a borrower's background can be time consuming and will cause lower loan more interest. Most poor businesses are tiny, and tiny businesses make little earnings. As the others argue, the poor never grow to the point where they start having employees or much in a way assets. End quote. This helps explain that quote. Microcredit does not seem to lead to a radical transformation in the clients' lives. If the business run by the poor are generally unprofitable. This may well explain why giving them a loan to start a new business does not lead to a drastic improvement in their welfare. End quote. Because their businesses are no black sheep and have many competitors, they often have low returns. Even though they rely on microfinance, low returns will make expansion impossible because there will be higher interest rate charge. Microfinance institutions are playing it safe and will lend to small businesses whose money are enough to attain. Moreover, corruption does intensify poverty. Institutions matter, and that foreign aids often come with the implicit needs to influence policy. Thus, corruption, institution, free market, equal calamity, and that we need democracy because institutions define the rules of engagement. And that is my research on the questions of why poverty exists. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you're looking forward to the rest three episodes that I'm going to be doing.